Can you make this make sense? It seems like British journalists have a knack for misconstruing Jordan Peterson's message because the conversation you're about to watch is almost reminiscent of the infamous Kathy Newman interview. But I think what makes it stand out even more is the bevy of controversial topics it takes on, and that's why I need to show you the bigger picture after you watch this next clip. But when you talk, say, about domestic violence, and there's a sort of thesis behind it, and I'm putting it in a bit, bit of a nutshell here, so feel free to, to, to rephrase it, that men are, in the end, if men are pushed too far by a too aggressive a feminism, there will be a backlash and that there is, you know, there's a sort of undercurrent of, of violence, be it verbal. Oh, that's a warning, not a, not a, that's a warning, not but, a, but it's not a, a commentary on the utility of that. But it's a warning that kind of, of suggests that. that there may be sort of fault in those who push progressivism too far, they will get a backlash. Some people, of course, see that as a bit of a permissive environment for bad behavior. Well, people tend to confuse describing the likelihood of something with supporting the fact that it exists. And I'm describing the likelihood of something, not, not supporting the fact that it exists. If you push too far on the left, you're going to get a backlash on the right. That's how things work. And this is just a derivation of that as far as I'm concerned. But violence often pops up in, in your work as something you think drives things. That you, I think you've said in relations between men are more are regulated by a background threat of force. And in oh, a sense, that's, that's why men have difficulty with women. Is that really No, sad? that's why men have difficulty with women who are completely out of control. But should, women have difficulty. should control women? Well, other women themselves, men, society, just like everyone is controlled. I mean, you're controlled by society. I'm controlled by society, and thank God for that. I mean, it's part of funny. I mean, you, you described yourself as a liberal earlier, and I think a liberal doesn't think that a society controls women or men. Well, let's say regulates. I'm a psychologist as well. But I mean, what is we outsource. To control a woman. What is this creature? How do we know when we met one? Well, I'm sure that you've met women in your life that 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 acted towards you in a bullying and detestable manner. It's very difficult for women to cope with that because they don't have any real recourse. And female bullying can be unbelievably vicious. And usually that takes the place of, takes the shape of reputation destruction, innuendo and gossip. It's well documented. It's very only difficult women, to defend. But no, men do it too, but men, no. Oh, but sorry, patterns, disproportionately women in any of you or not. Sorry. Yes, when yes, disproportionately women. That's what the data indicate. I mean, if well, men where are is the if, data on innuendo and if, gossip. Well, it's among antisocial behavior among adolescents. It's a well documented field. So, because people look at aggressive and antisocial behavior in women and in men, and in women it tends to take the expression of innuendo, gossip, and reputation destruction, and in men it take, tends to take the form of outright physical aggression. And there's a whole literature on that. It's, it's not a surprise to anyone. This has been known for, for, for 30 years. You have to be very cavalier in your journalism to dismissively chuckle at Jordan Peterson laying out facts from the field of psychology. For one, it is very well established that there is a causative relation in humans between testosterone levels and propensity for physical aggression. In other words, testosterone alone is not what creates aggressive tendencies, but plays a minor part into how it spills out into behavior as an outburst of physical violence. Now combine this with the fact that men on average have around 15 to 20 times higher testosterone levels than women, and you've got a recipe for men in society being more likely to have that hard line of physicality behind every level of conflict. The direct pathway from higher testosterone levels to physical aggression is summarized by an important medical paper on the subject called Testosterone and Aggressive Behavior in Man. Part of the paper clearly states that testosterone, quote, manifests itself in various intensities and forms from thoughts, anger, verbal aggressiveness, competition, dominance behavior, to physical violence. Testosterone plays a significant role in the arousal of these behavioral manifestations in the brain centers involved in aggression and in the development of the muscular system that enables their realization. Now, I understand why Jordan Peterson would be irked by the dismissive attitude of Anne McElvoy while she interviews him because there seems to be a penchant for journalists to commit the logical fallacy of the false dichotomy. Simply put, if Jordan's laying out why men tend to be more physically aggressive, that it's somehow a condoning of that behavior, when in fact, it's just an observation. Maybe that doesn't make her the perfect person to interview Jordan Peterson, and you can gauge that by how she tried to contest the psychological idea that people are ultimately bound and constrained by the relations and roles we fill. 
Every person is a node in a societal network, and the connecting threads between us prevent individuals from flying off the handle most of the time. I think there's a quote by philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau that fits perfectly here. He said, quote, man is born free, but everywhere is in chains. Those chains aren't necessarily negative because they can also serve to regulate our social roles, the element of shame and societal expectation, the law and the moral fabric of our culture are all examples of such chains. Stripping that off only ends in anarchy that leaves us with no real freedom to speak of. Look, women have to express aggression somehow unless you're willing to say that they're not aggressive. They tend not to do it physically, not to the degree men do, so they use other channels. And what other channels are there other than physical aggression if you're going to be aggressive? Well, you go after people verbally. You go after them with innuendo and gossip and reputation destruction. And that's how it that's how it works. And just to be clear that you think that's predominantly a female modus operandi. It isn't that I think that. Well, I'm it's that the you. clinical literature indicates that. It isn't that I think it. Well, I'm not interviewing the clinical literature, I'm interviewing you. What do you well, think? Well, I'm a psychologist and a scientist and I tend it. to and I tend to base my opinions on what I've read in the broad relevant clinical literature. I'm not making this stuff up. I studied antisocial behavior for like 15 years. I'm actually quite an expert on it. And so th we know that men are more likely to look, look, look at it this way. All right. Women are much more likely to try to commit suicide. And men are much more likely to kill themselves. And the reason for that is that men use lethal force and women don't. Now that's a big difference. Okay, so then you say, well, women manifest aggression towards themselves and to others, but they don't use lethal force. They don't use physical force the same way men do. So they have to do it some other way. Why do well, they what have the other to ways? do something some other way? That, like, because you can people take are your aggressive. Hobbesian war against, you know, so you're basically a Hobbesian. Life is no, war I'm all against war. Half and half. Half Hobbes, half Rousseau. That's why I'm not an ideologue. Because I don't think that people are good or evil. I think they're both. I don't think that culture is security or tyranny. I think it's both. And I don't think that nature is benevolence or catastrophe. I think it's both. And that's why I'm not an ideologue. It's demonstrated by the fact that there is what is often called the prison gender gap because men make up a vast majority of inmates locked in for violent crimes, making up just under 51% of the total population. Men still make up more than 93% of all federal inmates. In fact, men are more than three times as likely as women to commit violent crimes according to the U.S. Department of Justice. That's not an accident, and neither is it sexism that's landing disproportionately more men in prison. It's the manifestation of biological and sociological differences between men and women. That's why you hear psychologists talk about indirect aggression as different from direct aggression, because the former finds other ways to manifest than physical violence. Anyone that tells you a different story should ask themselves one question. If the data proves that women are much less likely to resort to physicality and aggression, then what other channel of aggression is left other than the social sphere? But I think the twisting of Jordan Peterson's words that we saw here only increased with this next topic, speaking on the contentious debate around modern feminism and the hashtag MeToo movement. Where do you stand on the MeToo campaign? Good thing? I think that it risks damaging the presumption of in innocence. I mean, there's plenty. Is there of... more to it than that? Oh, sure. Women, women, women face the the arbitrary admixture of sexual uh, advance and workplace and workplace performance all the time. It's a very complicated thing to sort out. We don't know how to sort it out exactly because, you know, I mean, NBC, for example, the American TV station has has made it policy that you're not to hug your coworkers, which you know may be true. Although I don't think it's the sort of thing that a corporation might be deciding for people. But we don't know exactly what the rules are for governing male and female behavior in the workplace because we've only been working together for about 35 years. We, years. we don't know. After 35 years, wouldn't it be possible to figure something out? Not when you're talking about a, a, a transformation in behavior that that's, that's that profound. I mean, we don't know how men and women can work properly together in the workforce. It's very complicated. But men do. don't know how to you compete know, with women. Millions of men and women across the world go to yeah, work you together have, day but, in, well, day out. You, but you are the one so, who asked about Me you're Too. The one me who, Too. Don't is, start with you're the one who. Me Too is a, well. Me Too is an expression of the fact that men and women are having a hard time regulating their behavior in the workplace. That's the only reason I responded to that. Because the question well, I think was it's more broadly suggesting that, that that some men are having a grave problem with it. What is the lesson of the Harvey Weinstein story for you? 
someone should have said something about Harvey Weinstein much sooner. But we could start somewhere else. We could start with Harvey Weinstein was wrong to do what he did before we get yes, round well, I, to yes, yes. Other, other people should have spoken look, out. It's fair, just that's look, the secondary no, no, order issue. Fair enough, fair enough. I thought that went without saying. There are going to be psychopathic predators. They're going to exist. And what has to happen is that people have to stop them because they won't stop themselves. And so I thought that was sort of implicit in the statement. Obviously, he shouldn't have done what he did. But you don't think that the culture in which he was operating, that there was particularly in his in world... Hollywood? In, in his world and in many other worlds, that there was a culture of, you know, let this guy's a powerful guy. He's the great silverback gorilla here. Let him get on with it. Oh, I think that culture was everywhere in Hollywood, which is why I think Not it's actually quite... Well, Hollywood particularly. I mean, the casting couch idea has been around for a very long period of time. And I think that the Hollywood types who are all upset about this should look to their own devices with regards to the role they've played in fostering the culture that managed that. Doesn't that discredit her previous to Jordan Peterson when he said that society controls or regulates everyone? You can't have your cake and eat it too. In the case of an abuser, it's the people around him that are aware of it especially in an industry like Hollywood that can serve as the greatest check on the individual. And it's incredible that Jordan Peterson or anyone else wouldn't be given the intellectual respect of believing that they obviously believe what Harvey did was wrong and abhorrent. In no way is explaining the circumstance around what he did an excuse or justification for it. I think what America finds itself in right now is a place where old moral codes and social structures are breaking down before we've had the time to rebuild something else in their place. That's where the tendency to pick and choose from the past and present comes from, with a desire for complete freedom, but not the societal regulation that ultimately tames the antisocial elements in a population. What's the sensible thing for women to do about Me Too, to your mind, and what's the less sensible thing? That, that's a hard question. It, it isn't obvious to me exactly what men and women have to do in the workplace to make that kind of sexual predation much less likely with all, also subjecting themselves to restrictions on the sexual aspect of their existence that would be unbearable. It's very difficult. What, what would be unbearable about that? How about everybody wears the same uniform to work? That's, that's what the Maoists... Well, look, if you want to eliminate the differences between men and women sexually at the workplace, you have to constrain the sexual differences. I mean, men wear suits to work. Well, we right? don't have to eliminate the sexual differences for people to work together with respect. You have to eliminate them to some degree. Why? So I'm genuinely well, Because you're trying puzzled. to... You're try the question here is, to what degree should sexually related behavior be impermissible at the workplace? Well, yes. it depends on how you define it. Should you be able to dress attractively? And if you can dress attractively, what do you mean by attractively exactly? Like precisely. Uh, I got right, into so, trouble. I mean, I, I hope I dressed nicely today. You look very well dressed to me, right? Your man and I'm a woman. We're both nicely dressed. Now we're getting on with the interview. What's the problem or perspective Well, the problem, problem is, is, is the boundaries of what constitutes nicely dressed. Because mm. there's, look, because part of what constitutes attractiveness... Part of what constitutes nicely dressed is sexual attractiveness, because you can't separate out human attractiveness, sexual attractiveness from human attractiveness. And so then the question is exactly where are the boundaries? And that's what the discussion is about. Where are the boundaries? Remember something about any code or rules in general. It's a small sacrifice of freedom on everyone's part in order to tame the psychopathic subset of the population from causing too much damage. That is why laws against deadly weapons exist, not because everyone's gonna run around and in people's lives, bang, bang, but because a small antisocial element of the population needs to be reined in. In the case of the modern workplace, the mere fact that Jordan Peterson is exploring why we're seeing cases and reports of harassment rise does not mean he's either calling for a regression into the past or a free-for-all environment devoid of rules. It means that he wants to spur the conversation, an important part of which it displays of beauty and subtle sexual expression in the workplace that have become intertwined with our notion of fashion and culture. All in all, I think this conversation was a missed opportunity because there was clearly a difference in the intellectual acumen and knowledge of the two people at the table, but the fact that Jordan Peterson was able to speak some hard facts to the people watching means there is still value from it that you can salvage.